Did you start it? Okay, I'll start. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. I pray you'd help us today just to uh, glorify you what we do, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. So guys, I wanted to run through some, um, give you kind of an accelerated tour through uh, algebraic number theory, just a little bit of it. And some of this, these, these will be familiar um, things you've looked at before, but just to kind of emphasize some of the theorems that we can prove with them, just briefly here. Um, again, these are my um, number theory notes. I don't really, you can try to follow along. Eventually we'll come to something in here that's actually something you might want to be able to prove for the final. Um, anyway, so the Gaussian integers, of course, are an important example, and uh, perhaps primarily because they're a Euclidean domain, right? As we've discussed, you could divide them and find remainders, and it's much like the usual division algorithm. Um, and that leads to some pretty neat theorems. Um, for example, there is a, a, a Bazou identity, basically, for any uh, non-zero pair of Gaussian integers, you can find um, other Gaussian integers such that the linear combination of them is the greatest common divisor of the two. Um, we also have the prime divisor property. If you have a Gaussian prime and it divides a product, then either the Gaussian prime divides the one thing in the product or the other. So you have this prime divisor property, which is pretty, pretty nice. Um, there's also unique factors, unique prime factorization in the Gaussian integer. So if you have a Gaussian integer and it's written as a product of primes, and you have another uh, expression for the Gaussian integer as a product of primes, then those have to be basically the same set of primes up to uh, multiplication by the, uh, the units in the Gaussian integers, which are plus or minus one or plus or minus i, right? So it's just like very, very analogous to integers, right? The Gaussian integers are pretty much all the big things. Now, but it turns out there are interesting theorems that follow from this. For example, um, Gaussian primes, uh, a plus ib with a and b non-zero, give p equals to a squared plus b squared a prime in z. So if we have a Gaussian prime, we can use it to construct a prime, an ordinary prime um, of a very specific nature. Um, and that basically follows from like properties of the norm, more or less. Um, but I'm, I'm trying not to do proofs in here because I want to save some time to talk about the test that, that happened. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, so um, prime, uh, Gaussian primes are useful to study primes, ordinary primes in the following sense. Um, this is uh, Fermat's two square theorem says the following. It says primes of the form 4z plus 3 that are not of the form a squared plus, um, are, are basically are not of the form a squared plus b squared. All right. Um, the remaining odd primes of the form 4z plus 1, right? I mean, if it's an odd prime, it's either in here or it's in there, right? Them's your choices. So um, the other ones, the other odd primes of this form are, in fact, in a squared plus b squared, are, are of the form a squared plus b squared. It turns out this is tied to what's called, called the quadratic, um, the quad, well, let me see here, the quadratic nature, I think it is of, of um, character. Yeah, the character of, what is it? Do you know? Quadratic character. Quadratic character of what? Do you know? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go on. We'll get to it eventually. Um, <laughs> this is related to your talk later. Um, let's see here. So um, anyway, here's an outline. We'll basically take p to the 4n plus 1, and with the help of, there, there's, there is some m in the integers for which p is equal to m squared plus 1. All right, so um, basically there's something called Wilson's theorem. It says that the product of 1 to p minus 1 is congruent to minus 1 mod p, and that basically says that, well, that gives us Lagrange's lemma, which is that there's some, some m, such m squared plus 1 um, allows p to divide it. And once you have that, it's pretty easy to use the um, a plus ib, a minus ib trick in the Gaussian integers to, um, well, let's just get to it here. So here it is, um, Fermat's two square theorem. If we have a natural number and it's uh, an odd prime of the form 4n plus 1, then it's equal to a squared plus b squared for some a, b in the integers. Um, so basically, use Lagrange's lemma to find an m such that p divides m squared plus 1. 
Um, but that means that P divides M plus I times M minus I, right? And um, if P divides M plus or minus I, that means that there must be a Q such that M plus or minus I is equal to M P Q. But that's troubling, right? Because if you divide by P, you get M plus or minus I divided by P equals to Q. But that can't happen because M over P isn't going to be, well, excuse me, 1 over P here. That's not going to be an integer, right? So this is not a Gaussian integer. And so what does that prove? So what does it say? It says P divides M plus I times M minus I, yet P does not divide M plus I, and P does not divide M minus I, which means what? P does not satisfy the Gaussian prime divisor property. Because we have this, this is a prime divisor. We, we, earlier, we proved that you have the prime divisor property. So um, it shows that what? It shows that P is not a, um, not a Gaussian prime is what it shows. It's an ordinary prime, but it's not a Gaussian prime. If it's of the form a squared plus b squared. And um, so basically then it follows that P is an ordinary prime of the form a squared plus b squared. Anyway, so, um, so my brain is still a little bit fried from grading your test for some reason. Um, let's see here. These things I don't care about. I mean, I care, but. So this, this was the key, though, to that argument. I mean, if, if you didn't understand it, it's okay. Um, I mean, it's not that complicated what I'm talking about, but all of these things and more can be found in John Stilwell's Elements of Number Theory. Very readable. It should be easy to read, actually, for you guys after having this course. This should be pretty easy reading, light reading, really. Um, but, um, well, maybe that's a little bit, a bit too much, but. Uh, basically, the, the linchpin to that argument, Wilson's theorem, is the quadratic character of minus 1. In other words, the congruence x squared, x squared congruent to minus 1 mod p um, is, is true, where p is an odd prime, right, of the form 4n plus 1. This is a quadratic congruence that, that is true. All right. So last time we talked about the four square identity that basically uh, I was trying to indicate to you that this Fermat's two square theorem basically is built over the two square identity which is attached to the Gaussian integers. Um, but it's also attached to, to the fact that there's this, um, uh, the words have already left my, my mind, the quadratic character of minus one for primes of the form 4n, 4n plus one. Um, let me go on here. So, um, you know, in number theory, one of the things you like to do is to look for integer solutions to, like, rational equations, I mean, excuse me, rational solutions to these sorts of, sorts of equations. And um, it's often the case that, see, the, basically the thing here is x squared plus 2 you can factor in here, right? In this set, x squared plus 2 factors into, like, x minus square to minus 2 times x plus the square to minus 2, right? And so you can use that to figure out things about possible solutions to this equation. It's a, it's a, sneaky, a sneaky thing. Um, let me see if I can get to the result here. Oh, what happened? Um, oh, so this, this argument that I have right here in the purple is basically due to Euler. Let me just take a breath and talk through it. All right, so let's see if we can understand it. So he's like, okay, so um, you can factor in this set of um, funny numbers, right? Because in Euler's time, this was kind of a wacky thing to think about, right? We we're talking about the 1700s. You know, the, uh, the imaginary unit was still kind of, meh, you know. And, um, but this is the kind of thing Euler tried. Y cubed is X minus square that, X plus that, right? So he's like, okay, so if he's going to say that these are relatively prime in z adjoined square root of minus 2, um, we're going to assume that this z adjoined the square root of minus 2 has a unique prime factorization. 
All right? If that's the case, this is a cube, right? Think about it. If you've got like a number equal to a number which is a cube, could you have something like, let's say, what's a good cube? How about 27 um, times what? I don't know. How about 1,000? So there's 27,000, right? If this is equal to p times q and p and q are integers, what can you say about p and q? What's that? If, if well, if, <laughs> if they're 3 and 10. If these are relatively prime, right? In other words, that means they don't share any common prime factors. The fact that this is a cube, right? I mean, this is 27,000, oh, 20, no, excuse me, I'm an idiot. Um, 3 times 10, 30 cubed, right? So the fact that the, that's a cube and the fact that these are relatively prime force both of these, in fact, to be cubes. So Euler said, well, if you can do that for integers, you can also do it for these funny numbers over here, right? So the fact that this is a cube and the fact that this is a relatively prime factorization of a cube means that this and that must also be cubes. Now, there's all kinds of like giant claims being made here, right? Number one, that they're relatively prime, whatever that means. Number two, um, that, uh, that it is a unique factorization domain. In fact, I'll... We've, we've seen evidence already that that sometimes fails for things like this, right? For example, z, z adjoined the square root of minus 5. We've given an explicit number which factored two different ways, both um, in, in equivalent factorizations. But anyway, let's stick with Euler here. And um, so if that's a cube, then cube this thing. Da -da 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 a little bit of algebra happens. And you can equate the real and the imaginary part. That gives you x equals to this. And 1 equals to that. All right, so you look at this thing, you go, wait a minute, I got 1 equals to this. But the only way that can happen is if, if b divides 1, right? b has to be plus or minus 1. Um, and we also need that 2b squared minus 3a squared is equal to that. But that has to also be equal to what? Either minus 1 or 1, I think. And um, so there you go. x is equal to minus 1 cubed. Um, plus that, so x is equal to 5, and uh, y is equal to 3. At which point I go, whoa, that's cool, right? Is he saying that's the only solution? Hmm. It's a solution. Is it the only solution? That I'd have to think more about. I think it might be, given these assumptions. Um, maybe... Let's see here. Well, certainly you can also trade x for like minus 5, right? If 5 works, minus 5 works. But I think maybe just the two solutions, plus or minus 5, 3. Yeah, there's no way that this could be. Um, those are the two integer solutions. There might be. I can't be sure there are not other non-integer solutions. But yeah. Now, this is not how Gauss did things, all right? And in some sense, it's not, I mean, Lagrange did some of this sort of stuff too, but there's, there's a reason that Gauss shied away from this way of thinking, at least for a while, is because he was aware of the issue with the, the failure of unique factorization over like z adjoined square root of minus 5. So he knows that these arguments break down, even though these numbers, I mean, these arguments are really pretty, but Gauss knew that it, they were somewhat unreliable. And it wasn't really understood why they were unreliable when Gauss was your age, right? Now he proved, Gauss proved that the Gaussian integers, Gauss puts the Gauss and Gaussian integers, um, but you know, <laughs> he, he proved that the Gaussian integers were a unique factorization domain in about 1830. So that's when he's like 50-ish, you know? Yeah. <sighs> Take the cube root of both. Well, if I take the cube root of both sides, I don't, I don't have a, a, a rational solution on that side anymore. Like the cube root of two is not, you know, I'd have to get lucky for that to be rational when I take the cube root, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, that I agree. 
Yeah. So, but the point is, this is like, what a bizarre way of thinking, right? In some sense, I mean, but. Uh, so, uh, we've looked at the Gaussian integers a little bit. I forget if we've looked at z adjoined square root of minus two or not in here, but that also has the division algorithm um, for much the same graphical reasons. And um, the units in z adjoined square root of minus two are plus or minus one. Um, relatively prime factors of a cube are themselves cubes inside z adjoined square root of minus two. So, in fact, in other words, I'm saying, hey, guess what? Euler was okay. <laughs> But let's see why he's not, let's see why it was dangerous. Let's go on here. Um, well, I'll get to that in a bit. But um, the next thing up the chain is z adjoined square root of minus 3. All right. And, um, and then this thing, z adjoined zeta sub 3. These are called the Eisenstein integers. All right. That's the same Eisenstein that we know and love. About 80% of you know and love for, for showing that irreducible quadratic, irreducible, irreducibility of, of, of polynomials over Q. Um, yeah. Now this thing, this thing is not a unique factorization domain. Um, for example, here we have the units in here. Um, oh, what are they? I think they're just plus or minus one. I don't remember. If you try to solve this equal to 1, I think only, yeah, look at this. The only way you can get this to be equal to 1 is going to be a is plus or minus 1, right? So the units in z adjoined square root of minus 3, plus or minus 1. So it's fairly obvious that 2 and these numbers over here are not associates, right? So here is two inequivalent uh, prime factorizations of 4. So there you go. This doesn't have, and you see that that kind of, that's going to put a wrinkle in like that calculation we just looked at for Euler, right? Like if you try to say, well, that's a cube, so the other thing on the other side must be cubes. Well, that, this spoils that kind of thinking when you lose the prime. All of those, the, that kind of thinking is driven by prime factorization. And um, so what's the, what's the rub? How to fix it? So. Stillwell explains it somehow like this. The picture here, the, um, I'm trying to remember, I think the blue dots, yeah, the blue dots are the z adjoined the square root of minus 3. Um, so these, these, I think actually this is, to be honest, I think the picture would be tilted because like this has things like um, 1 plus i times root 3. So, I mean, if you want to think about this in terms of standard complex plane, you got to tilt it. This is one of my complaints about Stowell is his book. His, like, I wish, like, would really like him to take some of his pictures and just put them 30 degrees like that or something so the students wouldn't go. But why is that z adjoined the square root of minus 3? Because this doesn't have like 0 and, you know, uh, square root of 3i, does it? I mean, I guess it does. Does it? Maybe it does. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Oh, I'm an idiot. This is actually right. Um, so like 0. This is 1, 2, 3, right? This would be like 0 plus i times root 3. This is 1. Here's 1 plus i root 3. I'm an idiot. I'm thinking of something else. Never mind. I take it back. No rotation. This, the blue dots really are z adjoined the square root of minus 3. But the point is, the dots are too far separated for the geometric argument we did to prove the division algorithm works. Like the fact that the Gaussian integers are close enough to each other that you can't get too far away from the center point is what drove the remainder being small enough to make sense of a Euclidean algorithm for the, for the norm. So in this case, what you can do to fix that, right, because we know once we have a Euclidean algorithm, we get a unique factorization domain, right? Because Euclidean domain implies. So just fill in the, just fill in the middle, middle points. And then everything's close enough so that you can always find one of these things close enough that the division algorithm works, basically. So this is somehow Eisenstein's insight is to just add some more things at the half integer points. So this zeta, zeta sub 3 is minus 1 plus i root 3 over 2. And basically, you just use that, adjoin that to the integers. And then that automatically 
it joins square root of minus three as well. So it's like, it's got everything that was in here and more. And it becomes a unique factorization domain. And so Euler type arguments like we were looking at um, are chill. I mean, I'm not sure I have the life experience to say that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I went to the Snowflex once, but I did not enjoy it. Um, it just seems like dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> like, isn't there some better way to like get up a hill besides like the whole process of anyway? I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm saying. It's exciting. It's world class. We love it. <laughs> so this, these are the units. Um, are those the units? Oh well. Eh. Anyway, the, the units in the Eisenstein, here they are down here. The Eisenstein integers have plus or minus 1, plus or minus zeta 3, and then also plus or minus 1, plus zeta 3. All of these have norm 1. There are six units in the Eisenstein integers. There are actually only eight um, possible units for these, these imaginary quadratic things. All right. Uh, one of the things then that we like to look at are these so-called algebraic integers. What's an algebraic integer? An algebraic integer, all right, is some number in the complexes, all right, such that it satisfies a monic polynomial equation with z coefficients, all right? So this is not something we've defined before, all right? But these are what are called algebraic integers. It's a quadratic integer if it solves a quadratic. So for example, this thing that Eisenstein threw in is, a, um, is an algebraic integer. All right. Um, you know, sort of a basic question you might ask, how about the ordinary integers? Are those algebraic integers? Yes. And more than that, every um, rational number, which is also an algebraic integer, is an ordinary integer. So this concept of algebraic integers, it just reduces to like the ordinary integers inside the rational numbers. So sort of conceptually, the algebraic integers are sort of whatever set you're looking at, they're, they're, they're the analog of the integers inside that set is a way to think about it. Oh, this is a famous quote. It's fun. If we, I don't know. It has nothing to do with what I was just talking about too much, but stop and read it. I love this quote. So like, was, I think it was, was it Littlewood? Uh, no, no, no. Was it? Who was it? I forget who this quote is due to. I don't know if it's Hardy talking about something Littlewood said, or if this is actually an experience of Hardy. But anyway, some guy goes to visit Ramajan in the, uh, in the hospital when he's sick. He tells him his taxi number is 17, uh, 729. and said it's kind of a bo boring number. And then what does John say? He said, it's a very interesting number. It's the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. <laughs> it's like, holy cow. Yeah, we're still unraveling how on earth Ramanujan did what he did. We're still inventing various theoretical machines to understand his sort of arithmetic intuition. Here's some other numbers that it can be expressed as a sum of two cubes in different ways. <laughs> Fun, huh? All right. Anyway, long story short, uh, these Eisenstein integers are, can be used to study the problem x cubed plus y cubed equal to z cubed. And um, ultimately, you can show that there, there, there do not exist interesting solutions to that. This is kind of the part, the start of the proof of Fermat's last theorem which of course is that x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n for n greater than or equal to 3. It's got no solutions. Or no interesting solutions, I should say. So let me see. Let's try to recap here. Um, last time we saw we could, that these, these sorts of numbers were helpful for understanding Pell's equation, right? Um, we were able to find rational solutions using this z adjoined square root of minus 2. Um, Gaussian integers, of course, are use, useful for studying primes of a particular form. Um, the Eisenstein integers 
solve this, this other problem here. Um, let me go on here. So here's a, here's a nice kind of synopsis of it. Um, if you have x squared plus y squared, uh, and you want to have, if you have p divides m squared plus 1, okay, so minus 1 is congruent to m squared mod p. Um, this tied into the story of primes of the 4n plus 1. Um, x squared plus 2y squared, um, p is, is equal to x squared plus y squared. P, P is, a, excuse me, a prime is of the form x squared plus 2y squared means that the prime has the form 8n plus 1 or 8n plus 3. Um, the proof is, is, is similar to the two square theorem. Um, eventually it leads to the problem of showing that minus 2 is congruent to m squared mod P. Um, so this is the, uh, what do we call this? What, 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 how do you say this? Uh, minus 2 congruent to m squared mod p. It's the quadratic character of... Negative quadratic character of negative 2. Yeah. For x squared plus 3y squared, um, a prime is of that form means the prime is the form 3n plus 1. This has to do with the quadratic character of minus 3. So, if you're sort of immersed in these things, you start to understand that all of these questions at their base sort of involve these quadratic congruence questions. What's congruent to minus 1, what's congruent to minus 2, minus 3, and so forth. Um, I don't know if I've quite done, here's a, another, again, another synopsis here of it. So again, x squared plus y squared prime, 4n plus 1, that's based on the quadratic character of minus 1 x squared plus 2y squared prime only if you had 8n plus 1 or 8n plus 3. That's based on the quadratic character of minus 2. x squared plus 3y squared prime only if you got 3n plus 1. That has to do with the quadratic character of minus 3. And so it, it raises this sort of general question. Q is congruent to m squared mod p. You know, when is that true? And this raises what's known the question or the conjecture I guess of Euler of quadratic reciprocity. Euler was unable to prove it. Gauss was. It was one of the things he proved when he was a little bit younger than you guys, I think. And um, so basically this is the conjecture. When P or Q are both of the form 4n plus 3, P is a square mod Q, if and only if Q is not a square mod P. Otherwise, P is a square, P is a square mod Q, if and only if Q is a square mod P. This is in a nutshell, quadratic reciprocity. But there's lots of cool stuff. There gets to be formulas. And I won't tell you anymore because if you really want to see about these things, for example, you can do a calculation like this. 37 over 59 equals this, equals this, equals this, equals this, equals this, equals minus 1. Consequently, 37 is not a square mod 59. like, what? But anyway, these details and more will be shown to you if you come to Nicole's talk a little bit later. I will stop stealing, <laughs> I will stop steal, stealing said thunder. I really haven't done much of it. It only seems like it to you because you know what I'm talking about. The rest of them have no bloody idea what I just said. <laughs> and it's, it's fine. You're thoroughly confused? Okay, my, my mission is accomplished. No. No, it's okay. I said I'm usually thoroughly confused. Oh. <laughs> oh, uh. But anyway, quadratic reciprocity basically is this tool for analyzing particular kinds of congruence questions at the level of quadratic equations. It's deep, interesting stuff. Um, anyway, so these are, again, the algebraic integers. I just defined them a, a slide or two ago. Um, we mentioned that the... Um, the integers are only al the only algebraic integers. Oh, this I'm sorry, this is not algebraic integers. What's this? These we have talked about in here. These are the algebraic numbers, right? Okay. Um, so here's this is this is not something we've proved. But if you have algebraic integers alpha and beta, then their sum, their difference, and their product is again an algebraic integer. 
This is not as easy to, like we proved that the, 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 we, we proved this result for algebraic numbers in here way, way easier because those are forming a field. <laughs> so we were able to basically use some like happy-go-lucky field extension theorem and we did almost no work to prove that. <laughs> It's more complicated. I mean, so it's, it's actually some calculation. I mean, it ends up being some really beautiful linear algebra that eventually results in a determinant being zero. That determinant being zero gives you an equation which takes the various sums and products as their zeros, and consequently, it's an integer determinant, and that shows you that they're algebraic integers. It's, it's one of the prettiest things I saw in number theory, for sure. But anyway, in short, algebraic integers form a ring, which is good. If they're going to be analogous to the integers, they ought to be a ring, right? Woo! Sorry. Trying to make sure I don't miss anything in here. So z join the square root of minus 3 is an important example because it has, it's not a principal ideal domain. It's, all, it's not a unique factorization domain, but it's also not a principal ideal domain. And for example, this, this ideal, this plus that, is, is, not, is not principal. And so if you look at a picture of this, this ideal in the, in the complex plane, um, I think it's the black dots here, all right? So it doesn't, it doesn't have the same shape as z adjoins the square root of minus 3, which is just this sort of rectangular grid, right? So it's got a different shape than the, um, the ideal which is generated by, I guess, oh, this, this right here, the ideal generated by the square root of minus 3. Um, so there's two different, there's, there's different ideals that have different shapes is the way, way, way Stillwell explains it. And so it, long story short, people think about this thing called class number, right? And the class number is the number of different shapes of ideals that there are in one of these given, these given rings. So like, I think z adjoins square root of minus three has class number two because you have two different shapes of ideals in that. Now this, this is probably hurtful to the ears of people who know about these things. I'm just telling you the sort of naive <laughs> geometric thing which is said in Stillwell. Not that naive, that, that Stowell's naive, far from it, but um, get to it here. Hmm. Okay, so here's an example. Um, in z adjoins square root of minus 5, on the one hand, you have 6 is 2 times 3. On the other hand, you have 6 is 1 plus root 5 times 1 minus root 5. But these are not associates, right? So that's an example of how unique factorization breaks down in z adjoins square root of minus 5. This calculation shows you how, that that's, how that's fixed if you think about ideals instead of numbers. So this is sort of part of this, this uh, like we talked about Coomer's idea of ideal numbers, replacing ideals, replacing numbers with ideals rather. So the ideal generated by two can be written as a product of these two ideals. This ideal generated by three can be written as a product of these two conjugate ideals. And so then you just kind of reorder them, multiply this times that or that times that, and you get this and that. And so you see at the level of ideals, these, this and this are really equivalent factorizations because they're just related by, um, I mean, the, 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 the so what, what fails at the level of numbers is it doesn't fail at the level of, 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 of ideals. Um, I guess, um, anyway, I, I'm only just showing you the start of these things and I should probably shut up about it. Here's the sort of the end, end remarks. So the class number of z adjoined square root of minus five is, minus, is two because there's two kinds of ideal shapes. Um, I don't, that's not, that's not it. Like the more interesting way and the way that Lagrange looked at these things is, so it, it all comes back to the question of, you know, like what values do something like AX squared 
plus bx plus by squared. So this is a quadratic form. So here is a, you know, q is a quadratic form. It's a mapping from the integers across the integers into the integers, okay? So the question is, what values does, does a quadratic form take, right? And suppose you had another, say, a prime x squared plus b prime y squared, such that, say that's q prime, right? And what would it, what would it, what would it, how, is it possible that, you know, q of z cross z is equal to q prime of z cross z? If that's the case, in other words, the values that this quadratic form takes are the same as the values that that quadratic form takes. If that happens, then they're said to be equivalent quadratic forms. That's an important question because that basically explains to you, like, if you set this equal to a number, right, well, if the quadratic form takes that value somewhere, then that equation has a solution. So these forms being equivalent relates to certain equations being interchangeable. And it turns out by a little bit of linear algebra, it's not hard, I would like to do it, but I just shouldn't spend the time in here. These just relate by um, an integer multiplication before and after by an integer um, matrix and its inverse. So it turns out that if you look at the matrix of, of these, oh, I'm missing something, too simple. There's also a CXY term. So it turns out that the, if the determinant, and let's put a two here just to be not weird. So A, C, C, B, if that's equal to the determinant of A prime, C prime, C prime, B prime, if that condition is met, then these two quadratic forms take on the same values, it turns out. Because basically, this just amounts to a reformula, like a, a change of variables for the other one. And so this was Lagrange's way of sort of attacking these questions that um, we've used the algebraic integers and so forth to look at. And this is the way of thinking that sort of Gauss took to its extreme. And this way of thinking, thinking about quadratic forms and the values they take that, that persisted as a dominant way of thinking well into the 19th century. Um, just to give you a flavor of it, I looked this up. Like one of the things Lagrange showed was uh, the following. Lagrange saw that the product of two numbers product of two numbers of the form um, 2x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared. If you take two things like this, all right? Then it's of the form <laughs> x squared plus 5y squared. And that follows because, um, you know, the uh, that follows because of these two these two quadratic forms being, um, well, ah, I've messed up the story. The actual story is opposite of that. What Lagrange saw was that x squared plus five y squared and two um, x squared plus two x y plus 3y squared. These are both, what's the determinant of both of these forms? So this has matrix what? 1, 0, 0, 5, right? This has matrix what? So what's the determinant? What's the determinant? Five and five, right? The fact, get this, the fact that there are these two inequivalent quadratic forms, both the determinant of five, by the way, there are no, you can't find any more, like there's not a third kind that's inequivalent to both of these. That is precisely linked to the fact that there are two ideal shapes in z adjoining the square root of minus five. 
and that's why we say the class number. The class number is the number of inequivalent quadratic forms of a given determinant. So like the class number of seven would be how many inequivalent quadratic forms you can find. Um, <laughs> Dirichlet, I think, found a formula for the class number using something called L-series, if I remember right. But anyway, there is much more to say here. The theory of algebraic number theory is very interesting and deep, and I'm just giving you a hint at the start of it. If you want to read more on these things, obviously Stillwell's book's great, um, but I think this book by Cox, there's a book, I think the title is something like Primes of the Form X Squared plus Y Squared or something like that. And this is a book that anyone who cares about these things tends to look at. So anyway, that's about all I have to say about these things. I just wanted to give you sort of a, just a brief introduction to this wild world of class field theory, which I don't know much about. If you want to learn more about this, you should really watch the lectures by Gross from Harvard that are on YouTube. You know, he has much more to say about these things in a more concise and accurate way. So I'll leave it there. Let me look at the solution to the test with you guys, if I can find it. Just in case, I, I, I have to be careful. You know, I'm getting more and more emails from the alt-right, so I have to, to watch out. Let me show you guys. Ah, come on. And I'm just like, I think I've told some of you, I'm, I'll be reading. I get some forward or something, and I'm reading, and I'm like, well, this kind of makes sense. And then all of a sudden, it's like, and the Jews. I'm like, no. Don't bring the Jews into it. They have nothing to do with it. There's no, you conspiracy people. I just tell you, it's. I, you know, I, I don't believe prophecies expire. When God says he'll bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them, I believe it. <laughs> so, all right. <clears throat> this probably would be more fun if you had your test, right? Behind you. <laughs> Behind you. Where's Brett? Oh, there you are. Behind you. So I think most of you, where's, most of you got number one. <laughs> hey, don't laugh at the people who didn't get number one. That's not nice. <laughs> Jerks. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry. These are in alphabetical order, but I don't think of you alphabetically usually, so it's not that helpful. Yeah, hurt. <laughs> uh, you know, there are many H's in here. Like, yeah. there are an absurd number of you with last names starting with H. Like, I think there's more, more H's than any other letter, actually. Mark. Audrey. Oh, man. I talked to her earlier. Mr. P, Mr. P, actually, Cooper, where'd you go? There you are. Jeremy, is there Jeremy? No, Jeremy. Wilcoxon. All right. <clears throat> Obviously, our time is limited. Um, I will post this in Blackboard, and I will try to find my test, too, and post that as well.
Uh, let's see here if I have anything that I should talk about specifically. Um, here, problem two. You know, guys, something that almost was universally forgotten. Um, you, you do need to make sure that there's actually something in here, right? The ideal test requires you to show it's not empty. Um, for me, I use the fact that A and B are in here to give me that A plus A plus A, B, I mean, that this, this is a combination that has to be in here because if A and B are in here, then it's combination. I mean, that, that's something that has to be in there. If I had, what I meant to, what I should have said, guys, is that R is a commutative ring with identity. If I said R is a commutative ring with identity, and for those of you who are like, hey, I have to assume R is commutative, I gave you a bonus point. That's true. <laughs> like, if it was non-commutative, I, uh, I don't want to talk about it. But anyway, so that, that's kind of a common misnomer there. For the rest of you, you should look at that. It's not that hard a problem. This here is actually not that bad either. The key here is to notice that Z mod the ideal generated by 3 is a field, which means that this is a maximal ideal, right? But that being a maximal ideal is precisely what is needed to say that R is either equal to 3 or Z. So that was that. Some of you got that. Um, not many people got 4. So here, typical mistake, x squared plus 1. x squared plus 1 is not irreducible mod 5. Because x squared plus 1 is equal to x squared minus 4 mod 5, which is x plus 2 times x minus 2. But your, your heart was in the right place. Um, for those of you who used a fifth order polynomial, you're further from the truth. Um, no, this is not a field because it factors over r, and that gives you zero divisors. All right. I said algebraic over r. You guys are not paying attention. Over r just means I have to get rid of the i. I'm done. This is allowed over r. Now, you still could get it right if you got rid of the square root of 2, right? Because if you show a higher degree polynomial annihilates it, that's still proof that it's an algebraic number over r. But be careful, because if I ask a question which is more about this, I could easily create a similar question that if you don't have this issue down, it stops you from being able to do the calculation, right? Like, you need to pay more attention to over R. That, that's important. Because otherwise, would it change the degree? And, and so this is why I took off points from some of you. You just wrote down this equal to zero, therefore it's algebraic. I'm like, well, no, that's not the definition. The definition is it's algebraic over R if you can find a polynomial with coefficients in the field that takes it as a zero. So it's important to understand you're looking for a polynomial with coefficients in the field. Some of you have made this the definition in your mind, that if you have an equation like that, it's algebraic. Which may or may not be true, depending on the structure of the equation. I mean, these are not terribly unrelated things. I'm just saying you should have clear in your mind you're looking for a polynomial with coefficients in the field, which takes it as a zero. That's all. I didn't take off a lot there. In fact, some of I may have I may have re relinquished on taking that point off. I, um, most of you got A. Most of you got B here. Many of you got nine. Not all. All of you, almost all of you, did not show me that the degree is five. You tell me it's five. That's great. But that's not, I mean, you can do better. You just say, by Eisenstein, that shows you that this is irreducible, and consequently that the degree is 5, right? My solution needs to be deducted a point because I didn't bother to say that the degree is 5. Sorry. Yeah. How do you show, I don't know if you're able to how do you show that there's no equation that has less degree than also takes it as zero? That's what it means to say it's irreducible. Oh. I mean, that's part of the irreducibility. Um, this was in the notes. Many of you got this. Some of you were fuzzier than others. Many of you got this one too. I was happy. Woohoo. Some of you didn't. This one here, I made this. I was really, really want a graph on this question if it appears on the final. So you have a graph to work on. I'm sorry there wasn't one. I'm very annoyed by that. But anyway, um, long story short, there's the multiplication table. And it is not the Klein 4 group because you don't have three elements whose square is the identity. So it's not the Klein 4 group. In fact, it's U5. And you can see the 
isomorphism if you look at those two tables. Or you could say plus or minus 1, plus or minus i. That's another group which it's isomorphic to, which is kind of a more natural choice. Here, and finally I'll shut up almost, I'm almost done. Um, you can prove that this is surjective. Here I even showed you the details. So I'm looking for, and you know, don't make your life hard, just use a linear polynomial. If you can get away with it, you can get away with it. That gives me a plus b, a minus b. So I'm trying to solve this is equal to m, that's equal to n. 2 by 2 matrix equation, invert, there's your formulas. As you can see, f of 1 is m, f of minus 1 is n. Consequently, f of x equal to this, plus that maps to m comma n for arbitrary m n. That proves it's surjective. Some of you more or less just wrote down this formula from brute force guessing. My, my kudos to you. Two of you did that. As far as I could tell, brute force guessing. I'm fine with that. It's surjective. You show me it works, it works, right? You don't have to prove to me how you found it, but you have to find it. Um, claiming it works is not the same as proving it. Um, this kernel, I was really looking for something a little bit more than just this is zero and that zero. I mean, that's a good, that's the start, but we can do better. These are polynomials over the ra rationals. So that means that x minus 1 and x plus 1 are factors. Consequently, the kernel is generated by x squared minus 1. No, this is not a prime ideal because q cross q is not an integral domain. It has zero divisors, in particular this one and more. So if it's got, integral, if it's got zero divisors, it's not, an integral, it's not an integral domain. And yet q cross q is isomorphic to the quotient of this. Consequently, that's not a prime ideal. Or, more to the point, and some of you argue directly, x times x plus 1 is in here, but neither x plus 1 nor x minus 1 is in there. And there's three or four of you who got this problem pretty much in its entirety. So, All in all, I was pretty happy. I think people are doing better, mostly, but not everyone. I mean, so, but all is not lost. If you do better on the final, you know, you can still pass. So, anyway, I shut up. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Let me go post this on the uh, on the blackboard before I forget.